Mr. Minister, uh, representatives of the embassies of Denmark and Turkey, uh, honorable member of parliament, mayors and councillors, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christoph Reuter. I work at the Ministry of Sustainable Development and Infrastructures. It is my honor and great pleasure to introduce to you one of the world's foremost speakers on urban mobility, Mr. Michael Colville Anderson from Copenhagen. Before I, list, before I list some of Mr. Colville Anderson's impressive credentials, let me just say this. In about 50 minutes, when you will have heard and seen his presentation, you will be asking yourselves one question. Why don't we do this in Luxembourg? And you will be right to ask that question. In fact, it is one of the questions that we at the ministry now hear consistently from our new minister, Mr. Bausch, who, as you know, is an avid cyclist himself. Now, you can imagine that the ministry did not invite Mr. Colville Anderson just to frustrate you even more about the current situation of cycling in Luxembourg. On the contrary, the objective of this conference is to bring you up to date on how we at the ministry now think cycling should be approached and to ask for your cooperation in achieving our goals in terms of active mobility or mobilité douce as we call it uh, in Luxembourg. Now you may know that Luxembourg has a strategy for making our mobility sustainable. According to the strategy, each type of trip should be allocated to the means of transportation that is best suited for it. For some trips, that is the train. For others, it is the tram. For many others, it is the bus or private cars. For trips shorter than five kilometers, especially in urban areas, the bicycle is in fact the most efficient means of transportation. And for trips shorter than 400 meters, it is simply walking as then you don't even need to grab a vehicle and then park it afterwards. Now two out of five trips that we make in Luxembourg are shorter than four kilometers. This means that we could make 40% of all of our trips by bike or on foot, if only our infrastructure welcomed us to do so. We do have sidewalks almost everywhere, and in some places we even have bicycle lanes. But when we use that infrastructure, we're not always under the impression that it was designed to handle 25 or even 40 percent of our traffic. That is why the minister has created a structure dedicated exclusively to pedestrians and cyclists as part of the multimodal concept. The mission of the Cellule Mobilité Douce is not to redesign every sidewalk or cycling lane in the country. The mission of the Salud Mobilité Douce is to create awareness for cycling among, and walking amongst those who do plan mobility infrastructure, to make them work together, and to check every infrastructure project that needs the minister's approval. For example, no road project gets to the minister's desk for sign-off anymore without the Salud Mobilité Douce having previously worked with Pont Chaussé to ensure the best possible conditions for cyclists and pedestrians. Of course, it is easier to do so when the project is still in its infancy than when the excavator is already uh, humming outside. Therefore, we have invited to this conference every single municipality, every single architecture, engineering, or urban planning firm, because we can only achieve our goal together. That brings me to the most important message of this introduction. If you are impatient about cycling and walking infrastructure in Luxembourg, then do not wait for all the others to do their homework before you do yours. If, as an architect, you design a building, do not look at the road to check if there's a cycling lane. Make sure a cyclist can get safely in, not in a direct line from that road to the entrance of the building and park his bicycle there. Because chances are, the next time that that road is going to be renovated, it will get some sort of cycling lane. If, as an engineer, you renovate a road, 
Do not look at the front yard of the buildings to check if there are any bikes there. Put in a proper cycling lane and bikes will appear in front of those buildings. If, as a municipality, you define your urban development plan, uh, PSG as we call them, do not check your current traffic and conclude, oh well, these people all drive their cars anyway. Reserve some direct and safe corridors for mobilité douce. Once they will be realized, only those who really love to drive will use their cars, while those who now take the car only because cycling would take forever or be too dangerous will go there on bike, by bike. And if, as a citizen, you look to rent or buy a house, ask the seller, how will I get in there when I'm old? Where can I safely park my bicycle? Or ask your town council, when can my child safely ride his bike to school? When can I safely ride my bike to the bus stop or the train station or even all the way to work? These will be the steps that will bring about change. Ladies and gentlemen, over the course of the past few months, when talking to mayors or city planners, we've consistently said, the fastest way to get into the right frame of mind for planning for the bike and the pedestrian is to either walk or take the bike yourselves or to spend one hour listening to Michael Colville Anderson. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. It doesn't prevent you from cycling or walking home, by the way. As an urban mobility expert and CEO for Copenhagen Eyes Design Company, Michael Colville Anderson is one of the leading global voices in urban planning and focuses on reestablishing the bicycle on the urban landscape. He regards the bicycle as the most important tool in our urban toolbox for rebuilding our livable cities. Few people have done more to promote urban cycling. It started with the now famous photo that launched a million bicycles on CopenhagenCycleChic.com. This kick-started the global bicycle boom led to the bicycle urbanism blog Copenhagenize.com the slow bicycle movement, the global cycle chic trend, the bicycle innovation lab, and even a Danish cycling NGO, the name of which I cannot pronounce, I'm sorry. Colville Anderson has coined a number of expressions to describe this modern bicycle boom, including cycle chic, cycle chic, sorry, cycle chic is... You have some of those too? In... Oh, good because uh, we will uh, go and visit Copenhagen shortly, and uh, that will be very welcome. So sh Cycle Chic, Copenhagen Eyes, Bicycle Urbanism, and Citizen Cyclists, a term that have been coined by Michael Colville Anderson. With his company, Colville Anderson and his team advise cities and towns about how to gear up for Bicycle Culture 2.0 and take the bicycle seriously as a transport once again. He works on a variety of projects, including putting the bicycle onto the curriculum in Sao Paulo schools, communications strategies aimed at encouraging citizen cyclists to consider the bicycle as a transport and working with architectural firms in order to get the bicycle into the designs from the beginning of the process. Together with the Dutch consultancy Mobicon, Copenhagenized Design Company gives master classes in bicycle policy and planning to planners and engineers around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Colville Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and um Thank you all for coming because I saw there was a lot of free wine out there. So I'm really impressed that you're actually in this room instead of uh, the other rooms because um, I know where I would be. But um, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, I spoke here last year, <clears throat> invita invited by uh, the, the city, and now the ministry has invited me. So all I need is an invitation from the Grand Duke, and then, and then we're done. <laughs> um, First of all, you have to know one thing very important, um, that how cool it is that you actually have a national cycling and pedestrian officer. I know what's going on all around the world, and we don't even have one in Denmark. Um, so the fact that you have one and uh, new to the job, but uh, with a lot of vision, I mean, it is really an impressive thing. And um, I will be definitely telling people elsewhere about it. A lot of cities 
have a, pol- a policy officer for cycling and pedestrianism, but like on the national level, it is really, really important. Um, and I've understood there's some political will as well to re- take the bicycle seriously as transport once again. I hope that at some point in Luxembourg, it will be like in Copenhagen at the parliament, where 67% of all the politicians who go to work at the parliament uh, ride a bicycle. You should see the bicycle parking if you're going to Copenhagen uh, outside the parliament. It's very impressive. Um, but my God, you need a policy officer. You need political will because... Um, if we look at what's happening around the world and, and the focus on, on urbanism generally, but also on bicycle urbanism, uh, Luxembourg is, is, is in need of, 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 of some uh, inspiration and some, and some political will. Because there is a new standard now out in the world in different cities about how we're thinking about our cities. I'm going to try and answer the question about, you know, why do the Danes cycle in the rain and the snow? Uh, you know, 80% of Copenhageners ride all winter, even if there's a snowstorm and whatnot. Um, but what the Danes and the Dutch as well, what they do, they do something very special by doing this, but, but they're not any more special than anybody in this room, anybody else in the world. We're all just homo sapiens. But they've been given the opportunity to do th- these special things. And I'm going to explain why in the course of, of this talk. Um, first of all, this is a bit of what our company does, and I always like to start the talk by saying something kind of important, that, that I'm not a cyclist at all. Um, I don't consider myself a cyclist. I rode to the airport this morning in Copenhagen, where in this clo- I had a jacket as well, but um, you know, 11 kilometers on safe infrastructure all the way out to the airport with my carry-on bag. Um, so I don't, you know, if my tire is flat on my bike, I take it to the bike shop. Um, I'm just a guy who happens to use a bicycle to get around in my city, simply because it's the fastest A to B for me to do so. And that is why the 52% of people living in the city of Copenhagen do the same thing. They ride a bicycle because it's the fastest way to get around. They don't do it to save the world. They don't do it because it's cheap. The vast majority, when we ask them every two years, they do it because it's quick, man. It's, you know, it's the fastest A to B. Going home from work, going to the cafe, going to the cinema, you know, going on that date with that girl I just met last week, whatever. It's simply the fastest way. 19% do it because it's, a, it's, it's, it's healthy. You know, not fitness, you know, not spandex rides on the weekend, but simply I get my 30 minutes of exercise a day, and I've heard that that should be a good thing. So me riding my clunky old vintage bike, listening to my iPod, I get my 30 minutes a day. So this is, this is, this is why we ride in the rain, in the snow, all year round. Um, every day when we get up and go to work, we work with bicycles at my company. Um, so bicycles are a big part of my life. All the different projects that uh, Christoph mentioned, uh, this is all a part of our daily life. But... I like to point out it's not all about the bicycle. It's, I'm going to talk about it today, but it's not about the bicycle. It is about really the future of our cities and how we want to, to plan the cities of the future, um, urbanism. And because of all the different kinds of projects that we do, I, was, I had to invent a new phrase, bicycle urbanism, to try and describe, because there was no more room on my business card. So I had to just have one phrase to describe it, bicycle urbanism, taking the bicycle seriously as transport. The bicycle is the most important tool in our urban toolboxes for recreating, rebuilding livable cities. <clears throat> and the streets of our cities is a good place to start. We all have a relationship with streets. We all use them every single day. In the 7,000 years since cities first were formed, streets had a very singular definition. They were, they were extensions of our homes, extensions of our living rooms. They were where we transported ourselves, sure, but it was where we met our neighbors, where we gossiped, where we met the guy or the girl we are going to marry. Um, they were the most democratic spaces in the history of Homo sapiens. All of that changed very dramatically with the invention of the automobile. Traffic engineering. There was engineers before that, and um, traffic engineering was kind of invented uh, with the invention of the automobile. Um, two things happened that, that really caused this massive paradigm shift in our perception of, of the streets. Um, traffic engineers were solving all of the problems that the cities were tackling back in this rapid urbanization in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And, and they, they, could, they did well. Sewers, electricity, all of these different things. But the automobile created a massive problem. The car started to kill people from 
the very first day it appeared in cities. And traffic engineers were handed the job of solving this traffic safety problem simply because nobody else was capable of doing it. Almost overnight, the perception of streets as being this very, very uh, democratic space was changed. All of a sudden, streets became regarded as, as puzzles to be solved, like... Um, like water supply or like sewers. They became public utilities, the streets, taken away from the people and placed in this box of public utilities. The other thing that happened that was also very dramatic was that the automobile industry decided to wake up and smell the coffee. They had a problem. They had very shiny new uh, products that they wanted to sell, but everybody hated cars in cities when they first arrived. There's actually, it's actually called the anti-automobile age. If you drove a car in a city, you were hated, you were detested um, because of all the people that were dying, you know, and because of this invasion into the democratic space that were the streets. The automobile industry, um, they, they realized that uh, they had a solution to this. They started using marketing and spin in order to change the perception of what streets were for. Um, in America, they have this expression, jaywalking. That's when you cross the street in the middle of the block uh, and not going to the corners. They invented this phrase. A jay was a negative term for somebody from the countryside who moved to the big city. And so they called these people jaywalkers. So if you live in a city, you kind of want to be cool. You know, it's, it's, you want your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Um, so if you start ridiculing people and calling them, you know, like a redneck, which is basically what it, what it means, um, this really, well, you know, this had a big impact on, on, on people. They had Boy Scouts handing out Flyers to people who were jaywalking, you know, scolding them for their behavior. I mean, you can't can't cross there, you know. And uh, so people started to realize, okay, damn, you know, I have to I have to maybe think differently about you know maybe go up to the corner. Um, they also invented crosswalks. Um, crosswalks came with the invention invention of the automobile, you know, where you um, get everybody up to the corner and they have to wait for the cars to pass. And uh, also in this city now, you have to push buttons, uh, you know, and wait for permission to cross the street, fill out an application form before you can cross the street to the other side. Um, Playgrounds. We all know playgrounds, these little zoological gardens into which we throw our children um, while we check our text messages now. Anyway, but um, these were also in a direct invention of the automobile industry. They, you know, the last bastion of the streets, uh, changing the paradigm of the streets, was the angry mothers, uh, the worried mothers, because the kids played on the streets. That's what they did for 7,000 years. And when you, when you run over and kill a kid, this really causes a bit of a problem. And a lot of children died, especially in, in America in the early days of the automobile. So they actually got together with some other industries and they said, can we do something about this? We got these worried mothers, you know, and they invented the playground. And a lot of the things that we have in playgrounds are an invention of the automobile industry. So finally, you know, all of these irritating, squishy obstacles were removed from the streets and they became the sole and exclusive domain of the automobile. And that has remained the case for over a century now. Changing that paradigm, changing the perception of the streets after 7,000 years, uh, it took about two decades, and then it was done. <clears throat> and now we all have, in many countries around the world, still this perception. Even in a city like Copenhagen, even in Dutch cities, the street is still that place where cars drive. And maybe if we're lucky, other people are allowed to use parts of it to ride a bike or to walk or whatnot. Um, but that was, that was the, the history of how, how things became as they are now. But there is a paradigm... Um, that is shifting now. This is a quote. I wish it was my quote, um, but it's not. It's one of my favorite quotes. The fact is that automobiles no longer have a place in the big cities of our time. Uh, this could be some politician from Denmark or the Netherlands from unpronounceable towns you've never heard of, but this is actually none other than the mayor of Paris until last month, um, Bertrand de Lannoy. And... Um, this is one of the greatest quotes because he was a man who, who, who you know, French politicians, uh, the mayors and whatnot, they always left their legacy, like some big fancy monument somewhere to say, here, I was here for like 12 years, right? And you're going to remember me. This man decided that his legacy was modern. He decided that he just wanted to make Paris a nicer place to live. You know, this is what, this is the modern legacy for politicians. Um, and he, this is a quote from 2012. The mayor of New York, Bloomberg, until recently, he had similar quotes like this. The streets aren't there for cars. They're for people and public transport and bikes. You know, so we have to change the way we think about streets. Mayors in Buenos Aires, in uh, in Montreal, Chicago, Vancouver, cities around the world where the bicycle has been forgotten, are saying things like this. So when you when you have people like that saying things like this, you have reason to be optimistic about the uh, the, the paradigm shift back to the way streets used to be. One of the things that I think is most important regarding traffic engineering, traffic engineers uh, um, design the streets, they, they go to their education and they learn how to, how to engineer traffic. Um, but for the most of the 20th century, at the bottom, that was the question that they were being asked. How many cars can you move down this street? 
It's, it's simply the basis of, 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 the educa- of, of the education. Traffic flow, computer models, um, trying to optimize the traffic flow for automobiles. I just think that we should change the question. At the top is, is the modern question. How many people can we move down that street? It's really a simple concept. Just changing this question, and we will have vastly different results. The model at the top... Um, A friend of mine was telling me, he says, there's five times more people moving down that street on the model on the top than there is on the one on the bottom. Tramways, of course, are are the hot new thing in Europe. They're not new. Cities are putting them back in um, all over Europe. Uh, And and cycle tracks as well, bicycle infrastructure. We're seeing this on the rise as well, uh, based on the Copenhagen and Amsterdam experience. But this is really quite simple. Let's change the question. It's not about the car in cities anymore. We have urbanization now like we had it in the early 1900s. We have people moving to cities more than ever before. We have families with children who have their kid in the city and say, it's kind of cool here. Let's stay here in the city. Let's not move out to the suburbs. So we have a lot of people moving to cities, and there's simply no more room for all of these people driving cars. So we have to think differently. It's just simply a rational, uh, realistic question. As it is now in cities and for the past hundred years, you know, cities are controlled by these mathematical equations and computer models down in the engineering department. And sometimes it makes me feel like we're all just characters in the film The Matrix. You know, we live in this world and then somewhere up above there's these people controlling everything. We don't even think about it. We don't think about, I have to press the button to cross the street. Huh. You know, why do you have to do that? I mean, it's, it's a computer model and whatnot. So, you know, just putting in a simple cycle track in, in, in a city, like a separated bicycle, you know, infrastructure, or, or traffic calming a neighborhood, widening a sidewalk. So many of these ideas die on the doorstep to the engineering departments in cities around the world because the, no, we don't have a model for that. There's no computer model. Frankly. We can't do that. It won't work because based on the models we've been using for 60 years, that doesn't work. So, so many ideas from politicians. They go to the health department when they're elected, saying, let's, do, let's reform health, let's reform education, and all the, the people in the ministry say, okay, we can do that. Engineering is like, nah, can't do that, man. Oh, and then the politician who maybe had good visions walks away because he was told that it wasn't possible. Um, so this is, this is really um, a question of, of living in the matrix, uh, and, and a, whole wor- a whole world is controlling the world that we live in, and we don't question it. And there are ways to do it, like I said, changing the question. This is, a, this is a short history of traffic engineering that I've developed. Um, you can see how it was for, for 7,000 years. It was pretty, uh, pretty rational, fast and quick A to Bs for uh, the people in cities until, you know, up to 1800s. Then 1900, we have, uh, you know, horses. We have the bicycles showing up on the urban landscape. We start to have some trams and whatnot. Still very straight A to Bs. 1920, we're still, some cars are showing up in the cities. But now from 1950s, when urban planning started to revolve around the automobile and everybody else was pushed aside, you can see how it is. It's a straight A to B in many cities for the automobile. And uh, everybody else is, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a bit of a maze trying to figure out how to get around the city. This, however, is the most simple graphic you'll ever see about how to plan a livable city for traffic. If you want people to ride a bike, to walk, to take public transport, you make those things the fastest A to B. If you want people to get out of the cars and change their behavior, and this is the hardest task that anybody who works with cities has, getting motorists to change their behavior. Once you're in the car and, and you, you use that car every day, it's, it's incredibly difficult behavior-wise to get them to choose another transport form. If my tire's flat on my bike, oh, into the bike shop, I'll take the metro. In Copenhagen, I'll take the metro, take the bus, I'll walk, whatnot. These people down here the, on, on the left, they, they are intermodal. There's a lot of intermodality between them. They, they don't have no problem switching uh, their modes. Uh, motorists, it's really hard to get them to think differently. The only way to do it, is to make driving a pain in the ass, and quite simply. Um, make it expensive, make it inaccessible, one-way streets, traffic calming and whatnot. This actually saves lives in cities as well, so it's not a bad thing. Only then, when that A to B is removed, then do they choose another transport form. All the campaigns in the world, and there's a lot of money spent on campaigns, ride a bike, it's good for you, or, you know, do this, take some public transport. They're completely and utterly useless. We could save a lot of money just by realizing that this is the only way forward. Cars will remain in cities, but there are too many of them in every city on the planet, even in Copenhagen. You know? um, so it's not about removing all cars, man, car-free world. No, it's just simply about being rational about it. They're killing people. They're making cities you know, not very nice places to be. We have to do something about it, and that is the way to do it. I call it A to Bism. And every time there's translators on, it's incredibly impossible to translate the A to Bism into uh, other languages I've discovered. So sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it works in English, you know. Uh, if you make the bicycle the fastest way from A to B, 
people will do it. The strangest people will be seen on bicycles. Think about the strange people you know and imagine them on a bicycle. That's how it's going to look when it happens. Take the bicycle seriously as transport, as a respected, accepted form of transport, equal with all the others. With my company, we don't work so much with the whole, you know, engineering and whatnot. Uh, we have people we work with, but we focus very much on design and direct observation, human observation. You can call it anthropology, sociology, if you like, but you know, it's just people watching what other people do. You know, that's my job, basically. I get to look at people, um, and it's pretty cool. But we focus. We use this uh, as a way of, of rethinking uh, how to, our planning cities. Um, just going to check the next slide. This picture here is the busiest bicycle street in the world in Copenhagen. There's about 35,000 cyclists or bicycle users, I like to call them, um, down this street every single day. There's this one spot where the city realized that a whole bunch of people were cutting across a sidewalk, which is illegal in Copenhagen, um, to get to a parallel street. So you could do two things. You could get the police to hand out tickets all day long and pay off the national debt within about two months. Um, or you could, uh, you could observe, which is what the city, to their credit, did. They watched and they, they said, why are these people doing it? Where are they going? They asked, stopped them and said, why are you going here? Um, you know, no, no, you won't get a ticket. Don't worry. Just tell me where you're going and what you're doing. So they discovered that there was a whole different mobility pattern with this brand new neighborhood that has been built. A lot of people were going out there to the new university and whatnot and, uh, and, and, and creating uh, a desire line. And that's what... It's got to be the greatest expression in urban planning, desire line. And it was a, ph a French philosopher, Gaston Bachelard, in his book, The Poetics of Space, in the 1950s, who, who described it. But desire lines are as old as Homo sapiens. It's simply when you walk through a park and you see that the grass has been trodden down, um, you know, you're on the pathway, but a whole bunch of people have been walking along that. That's a desire line. That's where the people want to go, because maybe there's a cool cafe over there or whatnot. Um, and, and, and that is... <clears throat> using desire lines as a way to plan cities is, is very important. The city put in a temporary cycle, uh, bike lane uh, on the left there, and they watched, and they saw how people used it, and they realized it was a success. So now on the right is a permanent cycle track over a sidewalk because the city respected the desire lines of just a few hundred of the citizens of Copenhagen. I love desire lines. You know, it's uh, it's... It's not really a geeky hobby. It's kind of cool, I think. But uh, this is my view from a hotel in Halifax in Canada a couple years ago. There was fresh snow on the commons, uh, the park in the heart of the city. And the green lines there are the original pathways from, the, I think, of the 18th century, uh, 19th century. Uh, perfect for promenading on a Sunday back in the day or running or walking your dog. But with the snow, I could see desire lines carved straight as arrows through the snow. Uh, that's the red lines there. People coming from the neighborhoods heading downtown and um, <clears throat> on bikes as well through the snow. The next day it snowed again and I'm there in the morning watching the morning rush hour and the desire lines were identical. They couldn't remember where they were yesterday because there was like a good 20, minutes, 20 centimeters of snow. Exactly the same. A modern city would observe and they would redesign accordingly. Um, we really take desire lines uh, seriously at our company. We, uh, you have to go to the next level when you're up against the matrix, basically. The matrix is powerful, right? So you have to think fresh and new. Um, <clears throat> we filmed an intersection in Copenhagen for 12 hours, um, and we mapped, I had an anthropologist hired, and she mapped the desire lines of every single one of the 16,631 cyclists in that intersection that day. And that's not even a busy intersection in Copenhagen. But we wanted to see exactly how these people were doing. You can put GPS on a bike, fine, but watch how these people were using the very car-centric intersection um, uh, and, and exactly which ways they were, they were doing things was absolutely fascinating. There's, there's no computer model in history that can replace 250 hours of, of direct human observation. We found out so many amazing things, not just doing our, our, our map and figuring out how people there were using the intersection. Even in Denmark, we have this perception of cyclists as, oh, you know, they're breaking the law all the time. You know, they're, they're running red lights and doing all these things. This, this perception, even in Denmark, it's a lot worse in other cities. So we asked, I've been asking politicians in Copenhagen and, and other people, I'm saying, how many cyclists do you think technically broke a Danish traffic law uh, based on this study? Oh, 20%, 25, 30, 40, I don't know. Um, the car lobby guys, they were saying 50 it's 50. It's got to be 50. But <laughs> we found out that it was only 7. Only 7% 7 of the cyclists broke a Danish traffic law. We actually divided them into two. We called them uh, one group momentumists, um, because if it was legal in another European city, then we thought that was kind of okay, right? Um, uh, so basically, right turns on red only for cyclists. This is now in place in several cities in France. They're testing it in Basel uh, it's, and also in Belgium as well. Um, 
you know, and, and running a red light, running a yellow light, riding a bike on a sidewalk, these were considered uh, pretty stupid things to do. Uh, pedestrians should have their space as well. But that was only 1% who really did, who broke a stupid law. So this has completely turned the entire discussion in Copenhagen on its head. It was being discussed today at a conference in Denmark. Um, you know, just data is, is proving, uh, you know, th- you know de- debunking various myths. We, we did all sorts of data mining uh, based on this uh, on, on, on this study, we found out when people were breaking, I mean, when, when were they breaking the laws that they were breaking? You know, when were the, was their behavior bad? Um, and we had no idea. We figured, okay, probably the morning rush hour, which is super intense from 8 till 9 o'clock. That's when everybody goes to work. Everybody comes home in a more spread out pattern. You know, it's, it's less congested. Uh, but we found out that in the morning, that's when everybody did everything by the book. We don't know. We have no idea why. We have some theories. In the afternoon is when people started to bend the rules. We think it's simply an anthropological thing with that we're all uh, like a, we're a flock of animals. So if you're packed into another, the, the rest of the flock and you do something a bit weird, people are going, hey, what are you doing, man? You know, you can't. You're with us here. You can't do that. Um, you know, but then in the afternoon, you don't, you're not, you don't have like 50 bikes around you. You can say, you know, nobody's going to notice. You know, I've got more space. I can, you know, I can just bend the rules a bit. That's our theory about why that happened. But nobody has ever looked at anything like this before. It's the largest study of its kind on cyclist behavior in the world. Um, we found out also some really super cool things about how they, when they were breaking the law, like if you were, they were riding through a pedestrian crossing or something, um, they changed their physical form, um, these people. So you, you have your standard way of riding whatever bike you're on. And then when they entered a zone where they were technically doing something illegal, they're very well aware. They know what they're doing or they know it's uh, breaking the law. They would simply rise up a bit. Um, <clears throat> And you'd think maybe if you don't know much about anthropology, that they would sort of hide, you know, oh shit, no, don't nobody look at me. No, they, they rose up and they kind of looked around at nobody in particular, and they always had a bit of a goofy look on their face. I know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just 10 more meters. <laughs> and then as soon as they hit the cycle track, poof, they assumed their position and rode off. Um, so that was absolutely fascinating. So we wanted to look at how to redesign intersections because we've just inherited the street design in Luxembourg, in Copenhagen from a previous century, from a previous mindset. We have to think differently. So this is the, that was the purpose of this study. Still today, even though best practice for bicycle infrastructure is about 100 years old, it's nothing new, uh, nothing that we do really is anything new, um, still you see crap like this being put into cities uh, as we speak around the world. This is from a, a European capital. I've promised them never to mention their name, uh, but it could be Luxembourg. Sorry. Um, you know, this is, this is no regard for design, the human experience, or logic, and certainly not safety. This is a question of ignoring space on the left instead of creating space for cyclists, weird ballers. This is a person who doesn't ride a bike, uh, like an engineer who doesn't ride a bike, who doesn't know anything about bicycle infrastructure design. This is just like he was told top down, dude, make space for bikes. Oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> Man, there's uh, some space there, whatever, you know. Um, the asphalt there is slipperier than regular. I mean, it was just, it's a disaster. Um, this is a question of squeezing bicycles into the matrix. Oh, God, I was told to do it, so I did it like this. Um, you know, we see things like America has contributed many great things to the world, the history of the world, but, like, they're really crap at bicycling. If you think you're bad, you know, go to America. Seriously. Um, they, they, they have, like, cycle tracks or bike lanes, painted lanes, on the left side of parked cars as almost a standard. You know, you're putting people on bikes in between moving traffic and the door zone of cars, you know, the, probably the, the stupidest place to put them, you know, you might as well just put them on a train track or something, um, you know, and this is, this is the greatest way ever invented to protect the paint on, car, on cars, you know, it's, it, we're protecting the paint job on those parked cars by putting squishy cyclists in between it, um, they have these weird things called sharrows, shared arrows, and they slap it down on the streets and say, we did that, we made bicycle infrastructure, no you didn't, you're, you're just putting bikes in with cars, dude. I mean, you did nothing. Um, again, squeezing bicycles into the matrix. In, mostly in North America and Australia and other countries, but also in many European countries, um, there is a low-hanging fruit. The, the, the lane widths for cars are, are incredibly wide. In America, seriously, some of the car lane widths are wider than Luxembourg. I mean, you know, you can, you can, just, you can drive and you're texting and you're drifting and you're going... Ah, oh, okay, I'll go back this way. Um, and, and, you know, so that they can actually narrow in their car lanes and create a space for, for bicycle infrastructure off to the side without taking away parking or car lanes. The Dutch have many, many studies about if you make the car lanes very narrow, motorists have to concentrate. They, we, we see that they have to concentrate. And, uh, and, and motorists concentrating in a city 
filled with people is probably a very good idea. Um, so there's, you know, this, I, this is a street in Calgary in Canada where I was looking down from my hotel balcony and I'm saying, you know, I sort of did a rough Photoshop job there looking at all the cars for, for the five days I was there and then narrowing the car lanes in in Photoshop and bang, you have two and a half meter wide cycle track just begging to be built right at the bottom there. So the, what the question I often ask is, is why, what if we used basic design principles to design our city streets instead of engineering them? Um, what if we designed bicycle infrastructure like we designed smartphones or chairs or toothbrushes or toasters? Um, imagine, all of you, whether you ride a bike or not, doesn't matter. Imagine riding a bike, you know, if... The infrastructure designed using the four types of pleasure that designers work with, physio, uh, psycho, social, ideal pleasure. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? Just try to imagine riding a bike. Somebody was thinking about your pleasure, your physical and your social pleasure when they built this infrastructure. You know, um, That would be pretty cool. Designers think about the end user of a product. Whoever made my smart, smartphone, the team, they were thinking about me, the user, my six-year-old daughter, my, my 86-year-old dad, and they can all use the, the same smartphone. They're thinking about the human being at the end of the design process. That's what they're paid to do. The company wants them to do that so that people buy that product. Um, you know, they, they're... Engineering does not really have that human factor. When they design certain infrastructure for cars and whatnot, it's the cars they're designing for. It's not the human experience, and certainly the same with bicycle infrastructure. Just using basic design principles would be pretty cool. What about if you design bicycle infrastructure like we design chairs, as a metaphor? The most iconic thing in, in human history to design. We have chairs from the Neolithic period and, and uh, you know, uh, interpretations of chairs. All of us, we see funky chairs like this, you know, various places. You know, we can all say, oh, cool, it's an octopus, but it's a chair. Okay. It's a shopping trolley. Oh, I see what he did there. It's a shopping trolley, but it's a, you know, it's a chair. Um, you can hate them or love them. It doesn't matter. None of us have these in our living room for our guests, right? We have other kinds of chairs. Um, if you want to use, uh, if you want to use the chair as, as a metaphor for designing bicycle infrastructure, um, that should say Luxembourg cycling map. Uh, sorry, I'm going to St. Petersburg tomorrow, so I, I mixed it up. But this could be a map of the bicycle infrastructure in Luxembourg, right? Using this chair as a metaphor. It technically works. This guy's showing us that it, it works, but it's not really connected. There's lots of sharp edges on it, you know. There's a weird carpet underneath which doesn't really match my drapes. But, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, all people want is a chair, okay? A nice design chair, an elegant chair, preferably, but just a chair that works. When you all came in here today, you found your seats and you sat down and waited, right? You didn't have to interpret the chair. Ah, uh, what was the designer thinking with this chair? Ah, I see where he was going with that. Yeah. You know, you didn't have to look for an on off button. You didn't worry about whether the chair is going to disappear from under you in the middle of my talk. You just sat down. It was easy. It was intuitive. Imagine if riding a bicycle or walking in any city in the world was as easy and intuitive as that. That is the goal, and that is possible. We have everything we need. This kid, this is Felix, he's 12, he's my son. He is a kid, him and his sister, they spend about five hours a year in an, in a, in an automobile. I'm not this big anti-car guy, I'm just simply a guy who doesn't have a car, right? and I don't need one. Only 29% of the households in Copenhagen own a car, and only 14% actually drive it every day. All the cars in Copenhagen are from the suburbs coming in. So, you know, this, this kid has no relationship with automobiles, it simply doesn't enter our conversation, you know. How often do you guys talk about cricket, right? I mean, very rarely you're going to talk about, you know, Australian rules football or something when you live in Luxembourg. It's the same for us cars. We just simply don't talk about it. But what was fascinating about the seductive power of objects and, and the seductive power of design, it can transcend all these other important issues like price and performance. We all run out to get the new smartphone. We probably don't need it, but we're being, we've been seduced by the design to do so and the hype around it. So this kid knows nothing about cars. We're playing an Xbox game, uh, a car racing game, and uh, you could choose from all the different cars from all the different brands of the world. So he's scrolling through, looking for a car to race, and, uh, oh, daddy, cool car. Oh, daddy, cool car, he kept saying. And then I noticed all the cars that he was reacting to positively were cars like the ones on the, on, on the bottom there, all pre-1975. I looked it up, you know, and that's when cars were cool. I mean, cars were designed really cool back then. Now it's this anonymous uh, fleet of, you know, black and gray things, right? You know, the, the details, or in the details, it's, you know, inside it's the tech specs and whatnot. So back then, this kid who knows nothing about cars said, those cars are cool. He recognized the beauty of the design of them. The bike that he's riding. This is a vintage bike. And um, he saw a bike outside his school. 
So on the other hand, we ride bikes. We all, you know, ever since he was little, been riding bikes. But it's just bikes. We have no fetish relationship with bicycles in, in, in my house. We just use them. It's a vacuum. I call it vacuum cleaner culture. That's what we have in Copenhagen. We don't have bicycle culture. We have vacuum cleaner culture. We all have one. It's in the closet. We all use it. You know, we don't go around polishing it or, or dressing up to go vacuuming. You know, or on a Sunday, we don't wave at the other vacuum cleaning enthusiasts. Say, nice ride. Yeah. You know, we just... It's just a tool for making our daily lives easier than the bicycle and the vacuum cleaner. So he, his, he had a bike. I can't even remember the bike he had before that. But he saw this bike outside the school. And he said, Daddy, cool bike. Next time you drop me off, you know, we got to find this bike. So we did, you know, and I said, oh, that's cool. It was a, a Schwinn, uh, an American bike. It was exactly the same, like a chopper like this with, a, with the, the banana seat and the, and the seat rest. And I'm going, why, are you, why do you think that's cool? None of your friends have that. That's incredibly important when you're 10, right? Like you have to have the same kind of bike as your friends. And he went, that's just cool. I'm going, well, that's bizarre. He reacted to the design of this bicycle. So I got him one which was similar, which is this chopper. And we ride around the city and everybody just rides bikes. We don't, you know, oh, that's kind of a cool bike or whatever. But he gets, he, he experiences experiences as, as a young man uh, that he has status on his bicycle. Seriously, we ride around all the time. And, uh, and you know, grown-ups will, up next to him on the cycle track going, cool bike. <laughs> when you're 12, that's kind of cool, right? Little kids, like, coming with their dad, daddy, daddy, cool bike, you know, and there's the big kid going, yeah, you're damn right, it's a cool bike. You know, um, you know and he's, he's moving into the, the whole horrible scary realm of women, of girls, in about, within the year, I'm guessing. So, you know, he's, he's you know, maybe there's some of the girls are going to react to the bike as well. Um, and that might be a cool thing, if he gets to kiss one of them because he has a cool bike. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> you know, a little 12-year-old kid, he has a cool bike, and the girl wants to kiss him. I just, oh, we'll see how that goes. Um, <clears throat> so, the seductive power of objects can transcend other things like the weather. This is not the best day to be riding a bicycle in Copenhagen. There was a snowstorm this morning, um, that morning, and uh, the city prioritizes cleaning the cycle tracks. The cycle tracks are the top of the, of the food chain. They will be cleared of snow. Uh, they will be salted before the snow even falls. They will be cleared of snow um, constantly if there's a snowstorm long before the roads are even touched. You have to do that in Copenhagen. If you have like these, you know, hundreds, a couple hundred thousand people who wake up and they can't ride their bike to work, you know, the public transport will implode. There's not enough seats on buses and trains, uh, you know, for these people. There'll be loads of man hours lost for society, all these people calling in sick. So that's the important thing. So right now, this is a snowstorm, but it was cleared like within 20 minutes. But these people know that it still works. It sucks. I'm on my big cargo bike. We have 40,000 cargo bikes in Copenhagen. It's really uh, essential for urban living there, uh, when you have, especially when you have kids. Yeah, that's, that's oh, what a crappy day. But hey, I know that when I'm finished and I go back, um, the cycle tracks will be cleared. This is not the best day, but you know what? It still works. The design still functions. Good design can also improve human behavior. Nothing less than that. Um, this is what it looks like in, in, in the rush hour in Copenhagen. This is what visitors to Copenhagen are, are absolutely baffled by, is that we just all wait for the light to change green. You know, um, we just sit there and, uh, you know, check our text messages or whatever. There is some bad behavior, as I said, but it's the 1%. The 99% just, you know, just sit there waiting. You know, they don't, the regular people don't want to break the law. Regular people don't want to have to, uh, you know, to you know, go through a red light on their bike, but they will do it because they're reacting negatively to the infrastructure design. In cities with no infrastructure, you know, uh, people will go through a red light. And there's been some studies that show that they actually feel safer. You know, they don't want to get hit by the car turning right, so they'll go ahead and then they'll sort of jump across the intersection. They're simply trying to keep themselves safe in their, in their subconscious. Um, people, when you have a good infrastructure network, they will react positively to it by sitting there waiting for the light to change green. You know, if you, if you have badly behaved cyclists uh, where you are, give them better infrastructure and you will see a massive change. It's interesting to consider Denmark as a design nation, which, which we are. Like my kid has like a design class in the third grade. I didn't, I didn't know that happened, but you know, they learned design for a week. You know, um, <clears throat> so there is a strong design tradition in, in the country, um, and it's interesting to consider that we have had bicycle infrastructure for a hundred years, and in Denmark, it's kind of all ended up in the subconscious in four types of infrastructure in the country. There are only four types of bicycle infrastructure. Um, 
There is where there isn't any. It's a 30 kilometer an hour zone. You don't need infrastructure there. You can share with the cars. Then when the speeds get a bit faster, the car volume increases. Then you paint a nice wide cycle track, uh, bike lane, one way, like two meters or so, is the standard. Once the speed hits 50 for cars and the car volume increases, you separate physically from the cars with a curb um, up, to, you know, onto the cycle track. When you get up to 70 and whatnot, you get the cyclists, you know, the hell away from from the cars. You have a wide grassy verge. Um, you maybe put them, you know, through a park or whatnot. If it's a motorway, you get them away from the traffic. You go to any city in Denmark, you take your bike on the train, you get off in some city that you can't pronounce and you've never heard of. Uh, you're going to come out of the train station and go, oh, there it is. And there's a cycle track. It's intuitive. It's wayfinding. It keeps people safe. It gets people to where they want to go effectively. Um, and this is really, I think, a, a great legacy is narrowing everything into four types of design. New street. Okay, look in the manual. And the manual for this, it's one page in the, man, in the, in the, in the design guide. You just say, okay, car volume, speed limit. There you go. Do that. A lot of cities, a lot of municipalities actually upgrade it. Where they only need a painted lane, they will actually put in a physically separated lane because it pays itself off within five years, one kilometer of infrastructure with the health benefits, 20% more cyclists on that stretch when it's separated than when it's a painted lane. So we, the, the cities of Copenhagen, uh, sorry, the cities of Denmark, they know very rationally, okay, we're going to save some money if we put a bit of money in now, we're going to be saving money, you know, in a very short time. So it's not like, oh, let's promote cycling and everything. No, it's simply about there's money in this for cities. It keeps the people healthy, you know, it traffic calms, uh, it, you know, it, there's so many good things, and it's a rational decision. <clears throat> um, there's lots of great greatness in the, in, the, in the macro level of bicycle infrastructure networks, but there's a lot of great details as well on the urban landscape in, in bicycle urbanism. Um, there's a ramp on the top left. This was a place where they, technically cyclists would have to go another 100 meters and turn and come back. Some guy at some point or some lady at some point were going, why do I have to go all the way down? I can just go here. <laughs> and they went down the little ramp there and then uh, more people followed. The desire lines is one person and then everybody does it. It's a, it's a, it's a waterfall. Um, so the city is to their credit, you know, they went, oh, fine. Here's a ramp then. You know, you know, it's against our design guidelines, but whatever people are doing it, let's just make it a little more convenient for them to do it. Bottom left, that's a manhole. I'm not an expert in manholes, but I know they're usually flat. That's as much as I know about manholes. This one, somebody angled it up when they were putting in this, this new street. They angled it up as a ramp to the curb. Super simple. One person said, there's bike racks over there. It's a university. Angle it, you know. Simple detail. This is a backyard in Copenhagen on the right. There's a, it's only offices, and um, there's this little curb to get up to the bicycle parking. It's not big. Everybody can just hop up. Um, but somebody decided there should be a ramp, and nobody knows who it was. I was really trying to find this person. Somebody sort of went... See you later. And nobody knows who it was. And I sat there one morning watching people arriving at the bike racks, and they're flying through the through the the old port, uh, and in, and then they, they aim exactly for the little ramp there, boop, and up, and they use it when they're left in the afternoon. It's fantastic, you know, mac, micro design by the people for the people. City of Copenhagen. This is uh, this is one of their ideas. Where they have cyclist railings and footrests all around the, about eighteen spots around the city. So when you're waiting for the light. Um, you can hold on to those, you know, that's the worst thing when you ride a bike is having to get off the saddle, right? Um, you know, so you have people standing there on tiptoes and stuff. So here you just put your foot up or you just hold the railing. And if it makes like a fraction of the day for this one person a fraction better, then it's a good thing, says the city of Copenhagen. On the, the text on the uh, footrest, it says, hi, cyclist, rest your foot here and thank you for cycling in the city. That's all. This is a campaign that we did developed for the city of Copenhagen. We just thought we should thank them. I mean, you know, they don't need to know that they're big, you know, they don't need a big hug every day. Thanks for cycling. It's just like, thanks. You know, what you do is cool. So it's very positive uh, messaging. Hi, cyclists. Whatever the message is, thank you for cycling in the city. Every time. They use it on all of their communication now. Uh, we did some prototypes. We put up little hand, uh, little little uh, uh, holders on a lot of the, the different uh, light posts and whatnot. And we filmed it to see if people would use it. And they did. They, they figured that out really quick. If you live in Copenhagen, and stuff like that. All the, the light posts are already rubbed really smooth, like right here. Because so the first person who gets there will just lean it up. You know, they don't want to get off their seat. So they'll, it's like completely rubbed smooth. It's like the bicycle culture version of the Buddha's tummy. All of these light posts, right? So we made a little handle and... Uh, 
just to make it a little bit easier, we made uh, garbage cans uh, that we could put up along uh, busy cycle tracks, and we analyzed the garbage. Uh, what do cyclists throw out? Oh, same thing as pedestrians, you know, banana peels, apple cores, uh, coffee cups, packs of cigarettes, newspapers. It was exactly the same. Um, so that was kind of weird, analyzing their garbage, but it was super interesting. Um, these are important times. We are thinking differently about our cities. It is very, very important that we listen to the greatest minds in the field. And that one of them is Lulu Sophia. She's uh, six now. This is my daughter. Um, and, and she really, I've written about her on our blog, you know, the, the world's youngest urbanist. <clears throat> she just fires off stuff. Like, without me asking, I don't, I don't ask her questions. I just let her speak. And she just keeps doing it. I'm writing it down. <laughs> really, that's interesting. I'm writing it down just to record it. So it all started, we're on our way to the hardware store on our cargo bike there um, in Copenhagen. And we're waiting at the red light, and she looks over, and she sees, for her, at three and a half, the most amazing thing in her life. She said, Daddy, oh, there's a motorbike with two people on it. You know, but for a three and a half year old, this was epic, right? <laughs> she never considered that a motorbike could have two people on it. And she was like, she was absolutely amazed. And I said, well, yeah, well, you know, they're friends, maybe, you know, they can ride a bike together and, you know, talk and stuff. But look at you and me. We're two people. We're friends. We're on a bike together. <laughs> yeah. Wow, she was just absolutely stunned. We continued on, stopped at another red light further along, and she, in retrospect, I noticed that I realized that she had been looking at the urban landscape, the urban theater, looking for other examples of two people doing this, two people doing that, uh, two pedestrians, okay, they can walk together, cool, you know, two, uh, two people riding a bike. And she says to me, disappointed, she says, Daddy, cars are silly. I said, okay, well, why are cars silly? Because I can't see the people in them. She said, a three and a half year old nails it, the, 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 the social exclusion of automobile society. She couldn't see if there's one, two, three human beings in that vehicle. You know, she was looking around, seeing cyclists and pedestrians reacting to the, to the humans, which she is also a human sometimes anyway, uh, you know, kids, <clears throat> but, um, she said, cars are silly. I can't see it. I can't, I can't feel the human or see the human in these cars. Um, she has a long line of, uh, of, of nuggets of wisdom. Um, and one of them was, uh, is something that has really had a big impact on the way that we think in our company. We're walking down the street one day and, uh, we're waiting for the, for the light and we're holding hands. And we were just a bit quiet at that moment. And she said, Daddy, when will my city fit me? When will my city, what, brilliant, you know, she's, she's this big, so when you're a kid, you're staring at like adult asses all day long, you know, <clears throat> garbage cans are like basketball hoops, you know, you, you're damn small when you're a kid in a city, you know, in a field, yeah, you're just a, a kid in a field, in a city, everything is massive, and I said, well, you know what, you're going to grow, look at your brother, he's growing, yeah, 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 I mean, she knew that, but she's just like, damn, I'm small, right, and I thought, what, what, what is, you know, the life-size city. This is the thing that we're t working with now. What is the life-size city? How do you define it? When I ride my bicycle down the world's busiest bicycle street with narrow car lanes and, you know, four meter wide cycle tracks in each direction because of the volume, I feel at scale with my city. I feel that I'm in a life-size city. Even in Copenhagen, busy boulevard with six lanes of traffic. I'm on a wide cycle track, but I don't feel at scale with my city. That's not life-size for me there. And it's the same, you know, in the, in the medieval city center, like here as well, everything's life-size. That's how cities were designed. Um, that's how we thought. Then, you, you know, you come, you know, I don't feel life-sized on the, on JFK here. This is, you know, this is, this is, it's just super wide where it doesn't need to be. I mean, you don't feel like you're, you know, you feel like you're, you know, you're you're a character in some other weird film where everybody's short, you know. And, you're, um, and you know, this is a way that we think now when we do our jobs. You know, what, what would make this life size? What would make uh, us feel at one with our city? Um, Felix, back to him again. I know parents who talk about their kids are really boring, and I don't normally do that. But my kids are brilliant. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> So I thought, okay, Lulu, she's just firing off this stuff. What about Felix? This is when he was in the third grade. And I went into the class, talked to the teacher. I said, I want to come in and I want to do this thing. And he went, cool. And I went in and I said, hey, there's this thing called urban planning. Pfft, never mind. I'm not going to explain all that. But it's like planning cities and stuff. I didn't want to give them too much information. I didn't want to spoil, you know, to, to plant too many ideas in their head. And I said, right, the roundabout outside your school that you all use several times a day, it's a bit of a badly engineered roundabout, even for Copenhagen. And I said, I want you guys to redesign it. I want you to go and look at it and figure it out, and I want you to make a redesign of the intersection, make it safer for people on bikes and for pedestrians, and while you're at it, think about how we can get people out of cars and in, into other forms of transport. 
and I, and I left. And they just tackled it. They divided up into groups. They went out on a site visit, and they're doing drawings, and they go back in the classroom, and they're discussing, and the teacher was great for this as well. And um, it, it ended up with uh, this fantastic model on the top right made out of milk cartons. They made a model of the intersection and the whole redesign of it. And... Um, it was absolutely a joy to, to be a part of this and to come back and hear their professional opinion about this roundabout. Um, this is what they figured out. One of the kids, he says, hey, why don't we just make cars ugly? Because then nobody will want one. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. It's rational. It's actually a rational thought from this third grade kid. Um, uh, they, just, they, they figured out, and they could not explain to me how, 15 kilometer an hour zone, sh- it should be around their school. And I'm going, how do you know that? Like, how did you figure out that? I don't know, it just feels kind of slow or something. You know, and, and it just feels right. And I don't, they might have done some tests there or something. I, don't, I have no idea. Um, but it's, the average speed for a citizen cyclist in Copenhagen is about 16 kilometers per hour. You know, there's people who go faster, a little bit slower. 16 is the average. So they nailed it right there, these kids. Um, Oh, they had ideas about putting a fence between the cycle track and the car traffic, uh, um, putting in light signals at the roundabout instead of just having a classic roundabout, making all the streets around the school one way for cars to make, you know, make it more difficult for people to drive, which is the whole graphic I had before. Um, speed bumps for cars, but not for cyclists. Um, you know, all incredibly rational. One idea was they were all agreed upon was glass roofs over all the cycle tracks in the entire city forever. So they never ever got wet in the rain on the way to school on the way to soccer or football or whatever um, And you know we can we can we can appreciate that r- very rational thought um, But I mean the way that these children think I have discovered it, it frees our mind You know we, we we rediscover logic and rationality. We live in an age of overcomplication You know we invent stuff because we can not because we need it and a lot of uh, city planning is like that A lot of architecture is like that as well so many aspects of our lives um, You know the glass roofs. It's a funny idea, but you know what as we speak there are three cities in the Netherlands testing rain sensors for, for intersections, for bicycles, for, for cyclists. So if it's, uh, if it's raining or snowing or the temperature falls too, too, too low, a certain level, these cyclists will be prioritized through the light cycles at the intersection. The car, the people in the cars will have to wait. They're sitting there with the heater on, they got the radio going, that's fine. The people on the bikes, it's wet. They just, we just want to get those people home. Let's prioritize them. So bang, it's just going to be like three to four times more light cycles for cyclists and the cars will have to wait a little bit longer on the rainy or, or cold days. This is the same kind of logic applied. In Copenhagen, we have the green wave for cyclists on all of the main arteries leading to the city center. You ride your bicycle 20 kilometers per hour and you hit green lights all the way into the city. Not in a car, I suppose if you drove 20 kilometers an hour, yeah, but uh, you get a lot of people honking at you probably, but on the cycle tracks, it's twin, all the lights for everybody, it's, for, it's prioritizing the cyclists. It has increased the flow, 15% rise in the number of people using these streets simply because you know, you're not stopping and starting for six kilometers with all the lights, you just, you just, you just flow all the way into the city, never putting your foot down. Um, same rational and logical thoughts as the children ha- in the third grade have, as Lulu has as well. <clears throat> Lastly, in this little group of experts, is a guy who is probably the greatest bicycle and pedestrian uh, uh, advocate in history. He doesn't know that because he died in 1347. But this is William of Ockham, a religious guy. Um, but he is, the, the, the concept called Ockham's Razor is attributed to him. And they use a lot of mathematics and whatnot. Um, but it simply, it simply states that simpler explanations are generally better than the more complex one. If you're sitting there with a whole bunch of ideas on the table, take the simplest idea, and you probably have chosen the most, you know, the, the best one for whatever you're doing. Um, but no, we have to overcomplicate. We, you know, no, choose the simplest one. So Occam's razor is another way that we work. We really think we, you know, we use the razor to cut to the core of all of our different projects. Um, so all of this begs the question. Right? What would the, st- the streets of our cities, wherever we're from, look like if our main consultants were five-year-olds, third graders, teams of young design students, and a 13th century religious guy? Right? What would they look like? I really think that they would be beautiful. I think that they would work. They would probably work better than they're working now. Um, and most importantly, I think with 35,000 people killed by cars in the European Union alone every year, that's a 9-11 every single month for 60 years and nobody really gives a shit about it, right? And, you know, it, these streets, if they designed it, they would be the safest streets, safer than at any point in the last 100 years. If we're serious about traffic safety, livable cities, you know, I'll give you Lulu's phone number. Well, she doesn't have a phone yet, but you can call me and I'll put you in connection with Lulu. I'm her agent now. Um, but this is, this is, it's, it's as simple as that. 
<clears throat> it's not about Copenhagen and Amsterdam anymore. You know, we did it for 40 years. We sort of did this and that, made mistakes, fixed them. You know, and now we're all that. That's really great. People come. They're inspired by these cities. But it's about the cities that are moving very fast. Zeros to heroes. How does that work in French? No, never mind, that's your problem. <laughs> um, this is the Copenhagen Eyes Index of bicycle-friendly cities that we do every two years. And uh, you can see the usual suspects, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Utrecht. You know, you have uh, some Dutch cities on there. But look at the cities that, that five, uh, sorry, six years ago had absolutely no bicycles left. Uh, Barcelona, Paris, um, uh, Dublin, Bordeaux, Nantes, uh, Seville. These are cities, there were no bicycles left. Every city in the world used to be bicycle friendly. Every city in, in the world used to be like Copenhagen. Maybe not 50% on bikes in, in Luxembourg, but there were many people on bikes in Luxembourg, you know, until the 19, you know, before the 1950s. These cities have gone from nothing to everything. Seville had 0.2% on bicycles seven years ago. Now they have 7%. You know, I think the, what's the modal share in Luxembourg? 2%, I think, uh, for cycling, something like that. Uh, maybe 4% nationally, can't remember. So they, they just did that in, in, you know, a few years. But Buenos Aires isn't on this list, but they are rocking and rolling. In the last two years, they have put in 140 kilometers of separated bicycle infrastructure and a bike share system, and they are really taking it serious. That's a serious, and that's a big city. This is the new normal. This is what cities are doing. This isn't some you know crazy, funky, little hippie idea that more people should ride bicycles. This is practical uh, and rational city thinking. This is solving urban, uh, urbanization problems. This is making societies better in a world of lifestyle illnesses. So these cities, you know, Dublin, Zero percent on bikes to like ten percent in the city center. Bordeaux, they put in three tram lines. They went from two percent to ten percent in only one year. Trams and bikes work really well together. In most of the bicycle-friendly cities of the world, are also very good public transport cities. So you're getting a tram line. You should uh, you know look forward to the increase in cycling. Hopefully, depending on the design, I haven't seen that of the streets, but you know technically. Theoretically, it's going to be a good thing. Um, so this is, it's not about us anymore. We have the best practice, come and shop there and stuff like that in Copenhagen and, and the Netherlands. It's about the cities that are moving fast. This is, this is the league you're in now, right? You're not going to, you're not in the Copenhagen. This is, that's the Super League. That's the Champions League, if, if you don't mind me saying so. There's other leagues now, right? This is the league that Luxembourg's in, and these are the competitors. And, uh, it's, it's very, very tough competition. These cities are doing it. Cities that aren't doing it, they're being left behind. And it's not very cool to be the kid who never gets picked in class, right? So, uh, there's, there's a new standard. Finally, in Copenhagen, Denmark, we have a monument that everybody goes and sees. It's this little naked green lady on a rock, right? A little mermaid. Wonderful fairy tale, kind of a lame monument for Copenhagen, in my opinion. This little, everybody comes up, they're going, that's it? That's, but she's so small. You know? And I say, oh, but it's the life-size city. No. Um, <clears throat> It, I mean, yeah, she's disappointing for 100 years of tourists in Copenhagen. So I just like to think that the greatest monument that Denmark, that Copenhagen has ever erected is the bicycle infrastructure network in our city and in other Danish cities. The same applies to Dutch cities as well. This is, this is a monument that, that, that makes lives better, that, that improves city life. You know, it's a monument to the past, the present, and the future. Um, this is the kind of monuments that are rising all over the world in cities like Bordeaux and Buenos Aires. This is the new city planning. This is the new kind of monument. Everybody, contrib everybody who rides a bicycle, who walks in a city, they are the architects and the designers of these monuments. The people in government and, and the planners who make it possible for people to do so, they are the designers and the architects. Everybody in this room is a designer and an architect of these modern urban monuments. Sometimes we always think about one cycle track or one tram line and all the, you know, how to do all this. It's, 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 you can get lost in details sometimes. And, uh, and, and, and it's really important to, to remember the big picture. This is, we're making cities better and we're building beautiful things. And this is my favorite quote about cities. Cities are erected on spiritual columns. Like giant mirrors, they reflect the hearts of their residents. If those hearts darken and lose faith, cities will lose their glamour. This is a 900-year-old quote, and it's more true today than ever before. We have the tools, absolutely everything we need to make our cities more bicycle-friendly, more livable, was invented at least 100 years ago. There's nothing new in the last 100 years. Everything we need has already been invented. The tools are there, the toolbox is there, the material for building it is there. It's time to do it. It's time to build the monuments and think differently about our cities. Thank you.
So we have some time for questions. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much. It was so uh, mind-opening and thought-provoking. You know, I'm, I'm a Turkish person, and actually I'm a Turkish diplomat. Uh, but I, I have to be honest, in Turkey, for Turkey, for a Turkish person, these are all, you know, um, very, very far away from what we have in Turkey at the moment. Uh, well, um, one thing you haven't mentioned, though, uh, there's, a one, there's one big hurdle for every person who goes to work in the morning and uh, goes back home in the evening. Uh, it's that the city topography. Uh, we have hills, and uh, as you can see, I wear a suit, and it's not always easy uh, to go up the hill, uh, especially when you are going to work. So what can be the easiest solution to overcome that problem? Thank you. So, yeah, we, um, the, the second city in Denmark, Aarhus, is a very hilly city. They, we make fun of them. They only have 19% on bicycles every day. And in Copenhagen, we have 52. So, you know, it's a provincial city thing. But, um, uh, but hills, like I said, every city used to be bicycle friendly. People used to ride bicycles in the hills of Luxembourgish cities back in the day. Not everybody. You know, in a, in a hilly city like this, maybe it'll never be 50%. But you know what? It could be 20%. And, 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 if you look at, you know, I wrote to the, I wrote to, went to the airport like this today. You know, if I had a hill, yeah, I just would probably get a bike with more gears, man. You know what I mean? Um, and, and the perception of, of like, as soon as you get onto a bike and you get sweaty, that's, you know, people, we know that in Copenhagen, if it's 30 degrees in the summer, I seriously have friends, they'll leave 10 minutes early simply because they don't have to ride as fast. So they don't have to, you know. Um, but I mean, there, there are solutions. Uh, if you have the infrastructure, if you make it possible for people to ride uh, up hills, down hills, whatever, a lot of people will do it. You know, it's, 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 it's not for me or uh, not up to me or you to decide whether or not they're going to do it. Um, there will be people who do it. Not maybe everybody, but it's possible. There are like uh, pedelec bikes now. So if you ride your bike, you can hit the little button and, and, go, and get a little bit of speed. The ones that where you get a lot of speed and you don't need to pedal, these are called scooters, and they should not be in cities, basically. But the ones that give you a little bit of juice and you can go maximum 25 and whatnot, yeah, this is a solution. You see a lot of that in Swiss cities. I was in working in Lausanne, which is, they have, you know, I'm with the bike people in Lausanne, and we went up this big hill, and you see, we have hills. Like, he was proud. And going, yeah, but how many people in this city go up this hill every day? All there is is a cathedral at the top, you know. I mean, you're not that religious anymore, you know. And they just, oh, okay, yeah. They, most of them go along the, along the lake to the university. Yeah, there you go. You know, you, you, you go for the low-hanging fruit first, right? Um, but it's, if you'll be, human, being will, human beings will surprise us when we, if we make it safe, first of all, infrastructure first. A lot of people will surprise us uh, on the hills. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, we, that, that shouldn't be a hindrance. It's simply reallocating the space on the streets to accommodate for bicycles. And then... Some people will be, will be doing that, and there'll be more space for the car drivers as well, right? And, you know, once people start shifting their mode of transport, it, you know, there was a study, uh, uh, the study last year in Copenhagen that said uh, that 67% of all the motorists want more bicycle infrastructure. Um, and because if you're in Copenhagen, it's right there in front of you. You're sitting at the red light in your car, and there's three cars in front of you. You're going, oh, get out of my way, right? Then you see like a hundred bicycles, literally at a red light in the morning rush, a hundred cyclists over there. You're going, if those three morons were on bikes, they would be, and then I would be right up at the red light, you know? So like these motors are going, yeah, more of that, because you know, they're not going to change, but like they're thinking that everybody else will. So they're, they're, it's really interesting how that works, yeah. I, I had a question as well, funny. Um, thank you very much for the inspirational talk. Um, I'm, when I'm thinking about, about cycling infrastructure in Luxembourg, I'm both increasingly happy, hopeful, and glad, but also angry. I'm hopeful and glad because when I was 12 and I tried to cycle to the local shopping center, I ended up in a potato field. The, the, the path just stopped. Did you get lost? Or? Uh, yeah, well, I, I turned back and, oh, right, okay. and never cycled again for 10 years uh -huh. because that was my, my reaction to it. I'm, I'm glad because they fixed this. Finally, something's happening. But I'm also angry. I'm angry because if I want to go south from where I live now, I still up, end up in another potato field. And nobody can do anything about it. When I go from my southern Luxembourgish suburb to the town center, I'm hit with an incline that I cannot make with my little son sitting behind me in my chariot. I've got a little bike trailer. And there's nobody asking me for my opinion. Mm. There's nobody coming to me and saying, hey, what would you change about infrastructure? And there's all these programs going on, and, and I'm really happy that they're there. But please ask me, because I've got 
a lot of things I would like to say about the way that I think uh, infrastructure should develop in this uh, uh, country. Um, and connected to that, I, I think a, a question I would have to you is, y you, you say a lot of things also on your Twitter feed about different aspects of bike riding, like, like safety, high visibility costs, and so, so on, and then basically removing the barriers to, to making it easy, as you said, uh, using bicycle infrastructure. Mm -hmm. would you, would you, how would you, if you ran a city, encourage people to, to, um, to use tools such as electrical bikes and such? Uh, because I think we've got subsidies for electrical cars. Why don't we have subsidies for electrical bikes? I mean, for a topography like Luxembourg, it would be bloody perfect. Mm. Thank you. So, I don't know if there was a question in there, but, uh, but I can answer. I can say something anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, why aren't they asking you? I mean, you have thought about, like, nobody's asking me. The 99% out there, they're, they're not thinking, why isn't anybody asking me? They're simply just going, I'm not going to do that, right? Like, it's in their subconscious. So it's incredibly important. Um, you know, citizens, uh, you know, like, t working with citizens in workshops to redesign the infrastructure in their neighborhoods, getting, you know, and, you know, getting, giving them an urban planning, like a map of the, of, of, of their neighborhood and going, sending them out on site visits, like the, like my, my, the kids in the class. You know, th that, bringing urbanism to the people is something that I would absolutely love to see a lot more of, you know. Uh, in our town, Town, you know, oh, what's something's going on at the town hall? Let's go see what that is. Ooh, a map, cool. You know, well, you know, I, I walk across there, you know, and then you place it in their minds that this kind of sucks if you're on a bike or anything. And, 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 and citizens should be, you know, activated more because, you know, despite it all, we're all pretty clever people, you know, if, if we ask the right questions of, of, of our citizens, you know. Um, yeah, it's. You know, getting up a hill or what, I mean, it's, again, it's infrastructure. You know, if, if the infrastructure is there and it is best practice and, and whatnot, yeah, you and, you know, e-bike subsidies and whatnot, there's, in Germany, they do that a lot, uh, in Switzerland as well. Um, you know, yeah, that's a question for your politicians, not mine. But, I mean, you know, um, it is, all of this stuff is there. Everything we need is, is has, you know, has been invented. It's all right there for the taking. So, you know, start shouting a bit more. Uh, well, he'll hope. That's why he's here. He's supposed to listen to you. That's his job now. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If I may say something, sir, uh, this is a perfect example of, of what I was hinting at before. Um, basically, what you're saying is you're waiting for others to do their job before you actually pr express yourself. So that's what I meant with the homework. Uh, don't wait for your counselors to do the homework and come to you. If you have an idea, go to your counselors and, and tell them about it. Uh, that's actually how it works in Luxembourg, and uh, we meet uh, councillors and mayors pretty much every day uh, that are interested in improving their cycling infrastructure. One obstacle is usually finance, but the other is how do we sell this to a population? It is quite amazing how far-thinking many councils in Luxembourg are in terms of uh, cycling and walking, and they need your type of input because they do get a lot of input from people who just don't want to uh, give away any millimeter uh, or take it away, have that taken away from their car. And in those people's minds, there, there needs to be some sort of balance from, of what they hear from the population, and it, it needs to shift a little bit more. And you shouldn't just be sitting there waiting for someone and being angry. You should just go there, and they will actually, most of them will actually be grateful for your uh, input. One additional note on that, on that note is... Um the good news is that cities all over the world, the weirdest cities, are talking about bicycle as transport, talking about taking this 19th century invention and put, making it a solution to 21st century transport problems. I love the poetry in that. Um, but it's actually a, a rational solution. So in 2005, the bicycle was not mentioned at all in any city council meetings in cities all over the world. Now it's back. So that's the good news. Um, and, and a lot of so politicians have heard the word, you know, they've heard, they've they they're on the uh, you know on the we're on the same page you know oh there's a citizen talking about bikes they're actually you know 10 years ago they're going <laughs> yeah <laughs> well click <laughs> right now they're going oh right okay this is a bike thing uh, the bad news is a lot of politicians i experience around the world in cities and towns they think that infrastructure is for those people riding bikes now like out there you that guy plowing up the hill with your kid now that we got to build like a cycle track for that one guy in our village or whatever right uh, they fail to realize the, the economic pot potential, you know, the, the, the rational potential of, of doing this. Uh, they don't fail to realize that there could be, you know, 15, 20% of the citizens on bikes if they were given the opportunity, the silent majority, you know, they could be uh, uh, encouraged to do so. So yeah, that's, a, that's a problem, you know, realizing the, the, the potential, you know, and there's so many, so many studies out there about the economic benefits for a city of building infrastructure and whatnot. So, I mean, you know, 
if you follow me on Twitter and other people, I mean, you, you, know, you can get a hold of some numbers and whatnot. So when you approach your local politician or whatever, you're very, you know, well armed with, uh, with with stats because a lot of these stats don't filter down to, you know, a, I mean, a city council or a mayor. They're busy. They got a lot of stuff to do. You know, well, I don't know. Well, I don't actually know if they're busy or not, to be honest. But anyway, let's assume that they're busy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, have you seen the cars that people drive here in Luxembourg? I think we have more Ferraris per capita than any place in the world, almost. I mean, the car here is huge. Mm -hmm. To get those people off the roads and driving, I have 160 some thousand, uh, hundred over 100,000 people who come here every day to work. Mm -hmm. Lots in cars. Yeah. So it's a, a big part of our society here, and hard to change that. I mean, that's not unique to Luxembourg. True. Um, no, I, that's true. Honestly. The car remains a status symbol. You know, it's like what you want to achieve. And, and when you can buy a nice car and then buy it, that's fine. I mean, you know, that's, that's the way it's been. Nobody's questioned that for, for you know, 100 years. You know, the car was always the thing to have, right? Um, more so than the nice little house in the countryside or, you know, or in the suburbs or whatever, right? Um, things are happening, you know. I mean, um, now, for the first time in, in 60 years, the number of young people who are getting their driving license, like even bothering to go and get their driving license, is falling rapidly in Europe, in America, in Japan. It's called the demotorization. Somebody gave it a name. It's cool. Demotorization of our, of our cities. You know, they're, they're, they have social media. They don't need to drive down to the shopping mall in, in that American city to hang out with their friends and walk around and, you know, go to the, to go to the Gap or whatever they do. You know, now they, they can arrange things on social media. They, they, ha they fulfill their social needs and then arrange a party and go to that party and whatnot. But they don't even have driving licenses. This is a really an interesting development. Development. So yeah, it's a tough, it's tough, it's a tough sell, but things are happening. You know, it's not just uh, me going, yeah, I wish it wasn't like that, man. People should think, you know, it's actually something that we're seeing in Western society. So that's a, a reason to be optimistic. But yeah, if you just make driving a pain in the ass, yeah, if you have a Ferrari, you're probably not going to care about, you know, parking tickets or whatnot, you know what I mean? But, but generally, you know, we were talking about this today, you know, uh, Italian traffic planners, uh, they have an expression for the people who drive through a neighborhood um, in order to get to another place, right? So uh, in front of my house, in my flat in Copenhagen, um, at 8 o'clock in the evening, it's a car for you can play Frisbee on the street, you know. And, but there's 27,000 cars going past my house every day. Uh, on this, But that's people from the suburbs who are going to the city center, right? And the Italians, they, they have a word for it. They're called parasites. And it's not even a negative phrase. Not, you know, it sounds great, but it's, it, they don't know. It's, it's just a, a way to explain. These people, they see a road. I have to go over there. There's a road. Somebody put one in. I'm going to drive it. They don't go to the local hairdresser. They don't go to the paint shop across the street from me. They don't go to my supermarket or support local businesses. They shop at home in their neighborhoods where they're from in the suburbs. Um, they contribute nothing to the host organism. But yet they use the street in front of my house. So that's why it's the, the parasite. You have like, I would, and you know, we want them to go into the city and work and support the economy and, 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 and whatnot. Like the 150,000 people a day who come into Luxembourg, you know, you probably want them to come because they're, they're working to, you know, to, for the, for the economy of the nation and whatnot. But it's your neighborhood, you know, and I don't want to call these people parasites. Like I'm, so I'm not using it in that negative phrase, but they are parasites. They're just, there's the fastest A to B to come from France or Germany is the car. You know, you build up your, uh, you know, your train network, you make that the preferred option and the fastest way you make it a little more difficult to drive a car you put in some toll roads or whatever you know i don't know i'm just chucking it out there then those people who are going you know if you have a nice super great high speed connections and whatnot you know they're going to choose that they can work on the train you know and things like that so i mean it's your neighborhood do you want the parasites you know yeah you want them to come here but how they're getting here is is a way that you have to think differently uh before you mentioned uh, the city of Lausanne, which is a very uh, hilly city, uh, a bit even more hilly than, uh, than the city of Luxembourg, uh, is there any uh, idea uh, to uh, look for a combination of uh, public transport, uh, the two tram lines, uh, they uh, realize now, and, uh, and, and biking. So to put uh, bikes uh, on the public transport, this could even be a solution to, uh, uh, for, for uh, b biking people to uh, go from, e from A to B mm -hmm. when it's a very hilly space. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you some uh, examples for uh, cities who, uh, who realized uh, solutions uh, for this problem? Yeah. Um, and you reminded me of another point, which I'll start with. Um, like, it's not all about 
everybody riding bicycles absolutely everywhere. You know, you're going to have people, there's going to, you know, we know in Denmark and the Netherlands that the kill zone is seven kilometers. Nobody rides bikes, you know, 95, what is it, 92% of everybody riding bikes in Copenhagen do not ride more than seven kilometers. And the same in the Netherlands. So the ones who are coming from farther out, this is only the 8% who are doing that. So it's not about everybody has to get on a bike and ride 20 kilometers happily to work, you know, in a suit or whatever. You know, it's not about that. It's about making the bicycle simply an equal you know, partner. I can walk out and grab a bus and go somewhere and I can grab a train or I can take a car. You know, the bicycle should, you should be able to have the bicycle next to you the entire day, whether you're on it or not. So you ride your bike to the train station in the suburbs of Copenhagen. We have massive, we're the third largest urban sprawl in Europe, you know, five hundred and two million people. So you can ride your bike to the train station and you park it and you get on the train and you go into the city center and, uh, and maybe walk or whatever, or take it on the train. This is a possibility as well. You know, we have the, it's all the different options are available where people can have their bike with them. Um, trams, um, it's interesting, I just saw, I think it was uh, Stuttgart, or another German city that starts with S. There's not many of those, is there? A big city? Stuttgart. Let's just say it's Stuttgart. Yeah. They, have, uh, they have trams, and they have, in the rush hour in the morning, they have, uh, the, the tram pushes a, a trailer... Like it's on the tram track, so it's just, it looks kind of weird, but I mean, it's just an extension. And so the tram pushes, and you just put your bike on there, and then hop on the tram, and then it just, so it's simply the tram as it exists is just pushing uh, a bike trailer. And then uh, during the afternoons and whatnot, they don't, they, they take it off, right? But I mean, it was for the rush hour, simply uh, for people going a bit longer, uh, farther distances. So, so yeah, everything we need is invented. Seriously, there's nothing new. Some city's probably doing something, uh, you know what I mean? It's, it's great, actually, if you look at it that way. Good. Yeah. Thanks. I may say something. Bye. Hello. If I may say something to that topic, in fact, uh, tomorrow morning there will be a meeting at the minister uh, at the ministry uh, between the heads of the Point Chaussée, uh, the the Trump Company, and the Planning Department uh, in the ministry to ensure that there will be uh, when this tram is put in that there will be consistent uh, bike tracks along the whole uh, uh, along the whole. Uh, track of the tram basically so that you can ride along the tram that will be planned in. The other thing is on the trams that we are planning to buy you will be able to take your bike with you if there is room on the tram of course otherwise you just cycle beside it. As far as the uh, trains are concerned no it, it's not going to be that long I mean uh, as far as trains are concerned we are uh, honored to have the uh, director of our national railway company in the room so uh, maybe you can later uh, connect with him and ask him how we get to our train station by bike that is I know a pilot project that Michael is working on uh, Europe wide with uh, major cities to see uh, maybe you want to say a couple words about that that's the that's something else it's all a boom everything's booming at the moment you know cycling and taking it seriously as transport but uh, tra a lot of train companies are, are, are also realizing that they're they discovering that they're a part of the mobility equation you know and uh, doing something about it so this project we're starting it's a EU project you know three years and whatnot uh, different partner cities it's called it's a really silly name but BTB it's bike train bike so it's taking the Dutch experience of having their uh, public uh, their public bikes um, and uh, basically replicating that in a pilot project in uh, in Liverpool, Milan and in Barcelona um, and in a, some Belgian city I can't remember um, and then you know trying to see if this works getting people to consider riding their bikes to the station they need infrastructure you know they want to feel safe so that's an important thing but like providing the facilities to do so I mean you know every train in, in greater Copenhagen the, the, the trains that serve the, the the urban sprawl areas and go to the city center you, there's like room for 60 bikes on every train they just double the capacity uh, and huge bike symbols on the side of the trains. I mean, it's, it's simply because there's so many people doing it. It's also to encourage people to do it. And it's free to take on these trains. The metro, you have to pay, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's all a part of the, uh, of the equation. So there's a lot of good practice in Europe, best practice in Denmark and the Netherlands, but other, other countries are rocking it as well with, uh, with regards to uh, the train company being an integral part of uh, and supporting, even more importantly, supporting um, you know, if well, people could ride their bikes to the station, I mean, you're going to have a lot more train passengers. It's pretty basic economics for me, you know, making that uh, an option. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, the brave new world also for, uh, for, for train companies. Michael, how many more questions can oh, you take? One more. One more. <laughs> uh, there's a gentleman in the back of the room. No, no longer. Oh, two. Then. Two. Yeah, two questions. <laughs> There are also other solutions with uh, topo topographical problems like uh, cold bridges or tunnels. 
And uh, in Luxembourg, we have money and space for bridges and tunnels and even to renovate bridges for motorized traffic. But if it comes to cycle traffic, there is a little problem. Perhaps we have still the money, but uh, there's no more space, especially on bridges we, which will be renovated now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's space. You just call them roads at the moment, right? There, I mean, there is, if you want to prioritize it, there's space. And bridges, often the, the lanes on bridges tend to be a bit wider than the roads leading up. I mean, this is just, you know, I don't have any exact numbers for that. You know, it's there. I mean, God, there are so many bridges out there where that cycle infrastructure has been attached to the side of it. I was just in, uh, where was I? It was in the Netherlands. Uh, Nijmegen. Nijmegen. They have this big bridge over the Rhine. And uh, the city, the guy from the city, uh, was, we were on it. He says, we just, see this, look at this bridge. Yeah, it's cool. We're on a bicycle route. I'm going, I can see that. He says, yeah, but it wasn't there when the bridge was built. Right? And, and I started looking at the construction of it. They just, they did a thing and they, it's hanging off to the side, you know? Bicycles don't weigh that much. You know what I mean? You don't have to, you, you can have a very lightweight construction, uh, attached to most bridges. Um, so it is possible if you, you think, Differently about it, you know. Um, not you personally, uh, but <laughs> everybody. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of, th- there's, I could, you know, if I sat down and concentrated, I could probably find 10 examples in the world of bridges where a bicycle infrastructure was added to it, even if it was a 60 year old bridge or if it was a bridge 10 years old or whatever. It, that, that's possible. Tunnels are tricky because who wants to ride a bike in a tunnel? But still, there are bicycle tunnels out there. San Sebastian has the, one of the world's largest, uh, sorry, longest, an old railway tunnel, which is now converted to a, a bicycle tunnel. It's all painted bright white loads of lights there's music playing because it makes you feel maybe you know you're in a tunnel and you don't know who's coming you know like if you know like, like a woman or whatnot you think ah it's a bit weird being in a tunnel you know um and uh but it's and it's surveillance and everything there's people sitting there watching it and uh it connects two towns that had no connection before so and and, and so it's that's possible Lyon Lyon has just opened a fantastic new tunnel and they built a separate tunnel they drilled a separate tunnel only for cyclists art on the walls you're going through the tunnel there you're going cool you know and there's lights and everything so you know People are doing stuff. There's solutions out there, engineering solutions for bridges. But, you know, um, it's, it's all right there in front of us. Yes, yeah, so uh, we have one more question because Michael's had a very long day. Uh, lady in the back row there, please. Hello. Um, well, my name is Ulla, and I'm from Denmark. I've lived in Copenhagen for many years, so I know how it is to bike there. Um, and I love biking. It gives you freedom and uh, extra exercise in in your daily daily life. Um, one issue you have mentioned here that I think is very important, tr- having tried to bike here, is the safety aspect. Because it, well, some parts of Luxembourg it, it feels okay, but and it's getting better for sure. Um, but um, it does not feel so safe. So if you have any more ideas of how to make it safer. Mm-hmm. So, thank you. Um, yep. You, uh, the most important thing you said there was that it, it doesn't feel safe. And that's your personal perception. So, and nobody can take that away from you. And that's, that's how many people feel about it, right? Statistically, it's still incredibly safe to ride a bicycle in cities. I always just like to point it out. I'm not saying we shouldn't do anything. That's obviously not why I'm standing here. But I mean, so statistically, it is, you know, a, a safe form of transport. Um, but yeah, there's loads of people. And when you're only at 2%, that's not because they don't want to ride a bike. It's because they don't feel safe. That's, we know this. Um, but everything's invented. You know, there's best practice for bicycle infrastructure. We know how to design intersections that prioritize the, uh, the you know, the soft mobility, uh, pedestrians as well as cyclists. You know, all the tools are there. And, and it is really, uh, you know, a, a question of just starting to do it. Like so many cities are doing it now. It's kind of embarrassing that there are still cities that aren't. So we have the tools for keeping people safe. The safest place on the planet to ride a bicycle, safest place probably ever in human history is Copenhagen and, you know, Danish cities and Dutch cities, you know. It's, the, the, it's absolutely amazing how that has been achieved. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, if you look at a rocket science, it was simply prioritizing cycling, creating the space 
for the cyclists, keeping them safe, you know, at the intersection doing certain things. So it's all out there. The whole catalog of ideas is just waiting to be exploited and it's free. You know, this is, this is, you know, oh, you can hire me, sure, but I mean, but like, it's all there. It's all right there. Copy paste. I'll, I'll leave you with the, with the best example that I have of copy paste. This is like urban planning control C, or if you're Mac, you're command C, control, command V, right? You take what you see in a city that has best practice and you transport it and transplant it to another city. You save money because you're doing it right from the beginning. You get instant results because we know it works in, in the past 125 years, you know. Um, it, and, you know, cities don't have a lot of money, you know, and, you know, there's, it's simply the, the most cost-efficient, logical way to, uh, to, to plan. Don't ask people who don't plan for bikes to plan for bikes. Figure out how to, from the best practice. The best example, Ljubljana in Slovenia. Pfft, who knew? In the 1970s, Early 70s, they, uh, they send a team of engineers up to Copenhagen. You know, this is like the Iron Curtain. It was kind of more of a, a beaded curtain, I think, in, uh, in Yugoslavia. But they came up to Copenhagen and uh, they sort of went, huh, okay, click, click. Maybe they're Holga cameras. I don't know what they had then. Click, click. And it wasn't an official visit. They just sort of, and then they sort of went back and they went, we have pictures. Hmm. Leave Copenhagen. Yes. And they just sort of said, this is the photos, right? And they said, let's build that. Let's just copy that. Like, this is Ljubljana, 1971, right? Yeah. And there was people using it. Oh yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah, okay, great. And they did it, and they just built 40 kilometers. It's a small capital. I think there's only 200,000 people. Uh, 40 kilometers of Copenhagen style, Copenhagen quality infrastructure for bikes uh, in their city, and they went from two percent to ten percent in one year after it was finished. People went, oh, cool. And people were, the strangest people were using it. It's the greatest example of just copy pasting. We don't have to reinvent the wheel when the wheel is round and rolling for us right now. So there is keeping people safe. We know how to do it. The people responsible for keeping people safe in transport, they should know how to do it. If they don't, it's a bit of a problem. But if they're visionary and they know how to do it, then it's right there in front of them. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. This has been very inspirational, as usually, and I have a feeling that, uh, or I hope that we will have you back, not just as a speaker, but also as a consultant for the team and the ministry who are trying to do things right. Uh, do you know you. the Grand Duke, too? Because I can know not him. Not personally, him. but uh, <laughs> there is Mr. Bosch, the minister. I think he has oh, yeah. <laughs> some connections, yes. Uh, we'll get him to cycle, maybe. That would be a good thing. Uh, vielmals merci, les dames et Herren, dass ihr kommen seid. Ich hoffe, ihr habt einen guten Abend. Wir uh, werden es besten machen, dass der erste Minister eine Reihe gut sagen. Ich werde wohl auch hier. Uh, wir werden ein bisschen dummer, ein bisschen mehr Sachen zu weisen. Uh, die können es aber glauben, uh, dass nicht nur die Polite, die hier vier stehen, daran schaffen, dass so wir sind zu Lützburg, wenn ein bisschen wohl auch Schwester fängt, tatsächlich überall da ein bisschen zu leisten auch an den Verwaltungen, an Organisationen, wo ich nicht noch nicht vermutet hat. Und, äh, voilà, wir treffen uns nicht mehr auf Leute, die etwas machen, die auch dafür ausgebildet sind, wenn wir so nach dem Ausland inspirieren, äh, wie in der Malerbeste möchte. Aber wenn dir, da das ganz wichtig, wenn dir an ihre Gemengen die politischen, äh, die Informationen gibt, für den Leute direkt zu steipen, die etwas wollen, machen, weil geht man, sind da ganz, ganz viel. Da geht das richtig sehr high für uns. Es geht aber nur nicht hin und wert einfach, dass die anderen etwas machen, weil dann geht er just all am Stau und dann hat sie da einfach noch nie äh, flott äh, zu Hause, wenn man will, durch eine Straße kommen. Na ja, kommt gut hin und dann äh, bis dann. Okay, merci. <lacht>